Hi there, welcome to the sixth episode of the design and construction of a curve tracer. In this episode we will take a pause on the design and construction of our curve tracer and instead we will take a look at an alternative method for generating a trace of a component using a sine voltage instead of a ramp. Such alternative method can be used on end circuit components, in other words, without the need to remove the component from the circuit in order to test it. This method, however, does not allow precise measurements of the components and it is intended only as a qualitative way of determining whether the component is fine or damaged. The final version of our curve tracer will incorporate both methods, the one based on the use of a sine wave and the one based on the use of a ramp with or without an additional ladder signal. Let's begin. Let's start with a summary of the ramp and ladder method. The device under test is inserted in a circuit where it is polarized through the two resistors R1 and R2. R1 is the load with which the component is normally supposed to work, and in the device we are building we will be able to select a number of possible values. The second resistor, R2, is a small one and is used to convert the current flowing in the DUT into a voltage that can be read by the oscilloscope. Changing the value of R2 allows us to select different resolutions for the current measurements. The polarization of the DUT is realized through the use of a variable voltage in the shape of a ramp, so we can generate the device diagram of current versus voltage simply by passing the ramp itself to one channel of the oscilloscope and the voltage at R2 to a second channel of the oscilloscope previously set for XY measurements. Eventually, if the DUT has a control pin, like the base of a transistor, we will apply a ladder signal to such control pin, thus generating a whole family of curves for the device, one curve for each step of the ladder. The sine wave method we are going to explore in this episode uses only a transformer that provides a sine wave of about 30 volt RMS and a couple of resistors. Resistor R1 is used to convert the current through the DUT into a voltage for the oscilloscope and also to limit the max current through the device itself. The other resistor, RL, works again as a load applied to the device under test. The sine wave is sent directly toward the x-axis of the oscilloscope and it is applied to the DUT through RL and R1. The voltage representing the current through the DUT is instead sent to the y-axis. The point between the DUT and R1 is used as a virtual mass for the oscilloscope. This way the oscilloscope will receive the voltage applied at the DUT on the x-axis and a voltage proportional to the current through the DUT on the y-axis. This method works really well for testing bipolar components and as long as RL has a right value we can even use the two probes on the DUT mounted in a complete circuit. That way we can see on the oscilloscope a qualitative IV trace of the device and figure out if it is in good working conditions or it is broken or partially damaged. Note, however, that because the sine wave on the X and on the Y axis are in opposition, the image on the oscilloscope will look like a mirrored image of the actual characteristic of the device, where the voltage applied to the DUT increases from right to left instead of left to right. But that is a very small price to pay to be able to run tests on in-circuit components. This sine wave approach is sometimes called an octopus due to the number of wires coming out to the test circuit, two for the DUT, three for the oscilloscope and two for the transformer. Let's now take a look on how this circuit practically works. Since this is just a prototype, I have used a fixed value of 1K for RL. The transformer is the same used for the power supply of the circuitry that implements the ramp and ladder method. Resistors R1 and RL are both of 1 watt and are mounted on this small breadboard. 
the sign-shaped voltage comes from these two wires. This is RL, and this one is the 3K resistor. The DOT, or device under test, needs to be inserted on the breadboard in this area, where it can connect with these yellow and black wires. The yellow wire is the side of the positive lead or a polarized component, like a diode or a zener, or a transistor junction. Avoid testing electrolytic capacitors with this circuit, since they will be subject to an alternate current and could be damaged. Right now there is no DUT and the input is open, so the oscilloscope diagram is a straight horizontal line. A short circuit will produce a perfectly vertical line, so everything with a resistance in between zero and infinity will produce a straight line at an angle. The smaller the resistance, the higher the angle with the horizontal. Let's now put a 1K resistor at the input. And this is the graphic that we obtained. Let's now try with a bigger resistor. And the line is now less inclined on the horizontal. Let's now try with a diode, and let's make sure we put the anode toward the yellow light, which is practically the side of the signal going to the oscilloscope y-axis. And this is what we obtain. Remember that we are viewing the characteristic of the diode mirrored with respect to the vertical axis. So the voltage is negative on the right side, becomes zero at the center, and positive on the left side. And as expected for a diode, it will have no current when it's inversely polarized, while when directly polarized, the current shuts up to the max allowed by the resistors in series with the diode. You may notice that that happens not just after the zero volt, but a little left than that. And in fact, that is supposed to be the forward voltage of the diode, which for this particular one should be around 0.6 volt. Let's now try with a Zener diode. And you can see that for direct polarization it behaves like a normal diode. But when inversely polarized, as soon as the voltage exceeds the Zener voltage, in this case 5.1 volt, the current starts flowing liberally, limited only by the series resistor. Well, let's take a break now and continue our discussion in the next episode. In there, we will repeat the same measurements we saw today, and more, but using the ramp and ladder method, so we can verify that our design works well for our needs. And while waiting to do so, I'll leave you with my usual happy experiments.